visiting squad. Because UCF out of the American, the higher ranked team, eighth in the country. Matthew Wright set to put it in the air. LSU won the toss. They want the football first. There will be no deferring here today. Clyde Edwards Belair is back deep for the Tigers. And we are underway in the PlayStation Fiesta Bowl. And it is Belair. Out to the 20. Out to the 25. Past the 30. Right up the middle. Clyde Edwards Belair. Cutting all the way across the field. And he is taken down by Rashad Causey. Inside the 20, it's a 79-yard kick return to start the game. Any question about LSU being ready to play? It looks like Clyde Edwards-Alaire was ready to play. He's 5'9", 212 pounds. Looks like UCF had him bottled up not once but twice. Not able to get him on the ground. And great effort by Rashad Causey to save the touchdown. Tigers are in business to begin. First down and 10 from the 16 of UCF. On the ground is Nick Brossette. He'll reverse course. Brossette trying to pick up a block from his quarterback and he'll be banged out inside the four. It's a gain of 11. Joe Burrow, the quarterback, was proud to tell us this is his third Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> He's picked up three Fiesta Bowl watches. He says the most recent one is the best one. Two Fiesta Bowls with Ohio State, but this first one he's had an opportunity to play in. First and goal from the five. What a start for LSU. Again up the middle, it's Brosette, and this time he's dropped for a loss. Tristan Hill among the nice players to make the stop. UCF, this entire season, they have given up yard after yard defensively. But when they get in the red zone, Steve, they have been up to the task. They only give up an average of 21 points a game, and that's the only stat that matters on the defensive side. Second down and goal after the loss. Burrow going to keep it. And crashes down close to the goal line. Going to be stopped short by Kyle Gibson. Bring up a third and goal. Last time we saw Joe Burrow against Texas A&M in overtime, he was running for touchdowns. Looked like he was on top of a player and may have crossed the goal line. They're going to go fast. No, they're not. They got the buzz down just in time, and a flag comes out. Full start. Number 77, offense. Five-yard penalty, third down. So no review. Guys, I'm standing about 12 yards away from the, or, and I thought he crossed the end zone. Because I thought, like you said, Brian, that he was on top of the defender. He gave a great second effort, got the ball right on the goal line. It looked like, Todd, his knees were definitely in the air. The question is the left elbow. Check a look at the left elbow or forearm. If that forearm goes down, that would make him down. But I thought, I thought he did cross the plane of the goal line. And now you get pushed back after a penalty, and it's third and goal from the six. Not sure why you went up-tempo there. They'll give him a chance to review it. Exactly. Here's Burrow to throw for the first time. Gets out of trouble. And the pass is incomplete. Dumped it off the turf. Nate Evans had the pressure. Forcing Burrow into the stake, and it's fourth and goal. Good pressure from Nate Evans. He was in man-to-man -man coverage. He's right here, and when he sees the back block, that frees him up. As soon as Brissett blocks, then he's going to go after. Burrow tries to get to Brissett, but the pressure by Evans prevents it. So this will be a win for UCF. Here's Cole Tracy on to attempt the field goal from 24 yards away. Snap and place to perfect. So too is the kick. Cole Tracy. Wow, how this game started, and all the talk, as you said, would LSU be ready? Oh, they were ready in a big way. The opening kick return by Clyde edwards Elaire. 79 yards, winds up setting up the field goal in the end for LSU. And the story of Elaire.
10 days ago out of Baton Rouge came the news that the running back and his close friend and teammate Jared Small were involved in a fatal shooting while trying to sell an electronic device. They were held at gunpoint in an attempted robbery. And the players used a legally owned handgun that was in their car and shot the man who later died at the scene. Police have concluded the players acted in self-defense and were not charged. Two young men. What an awful, yeah, awful story. I mean, a traumatic story for those two young men. And, and for, and for by all accounts, Ed Orgeron says that Edward Zolaire uh, has handled this emotionally. We gave him the, the support that he needed. Avery Atkins slipped on the kick. And that allows an up man for UCF, Sean Burgess Becker, to come up with it. And so the Knights will have excellent field position. But, but for Edwards or Lair yes. to come out here with all he's been through and on the opening kickoff did what he did, and he's a big part of this game plan for LSU today. Both running the football, catching out of the backfield. He's their wildcat quarterback, so he needs to be dialed in for them to have success today. Coach Ogeron told us they had an 8 a.m. practice on the day of the, the tragedy. The players got done. They were on their way to go hunting. They got a phone call at noon. Headed for a hospital, brief counselors, and the Tigers and the LSU football family have been dealing with this since. First down and 10 for Darryl Mack. Hands off to Otis Anderson, and he'll try the left side for a couple of yards. For Darryl Mark Mack, he is the backup to Mackenzie Milton. This is just his third career start. Struggled with some ball control issues. Fumbled three times in the first half in the championship game against Memphis. Only losing two of them. The throw to Mack. So we know he can throw, he can run, and we know he can catch. Great idea here from Josh Heupel early in this game, knowing LSU is going to be jazzed defensively. Get them running to one side and throw the football back to D.J. Mack. 22 yards on the trickeration. Adrian Killings, the ball carrier now. And he'll be close to another first down. Patrick Queen made the stop. Don't blink today because you, you might miss a snap if yeah. UCF has the ball. They're going to run the ball about every 15 or 16 seconds. Let's send the replay crew home. I mean, our replay crew. Here's Mack to throw and take a shot. It's like the signals got crossed up looking with Trey Nixon. Carrie Vincent had the coverage. You're going to see a lot of tricks in the bag from UCF today. You see this, they hand the ball off, run in one way, throw back the other. And DJ Mack at 230 pounds. He is not easy to get on the ground. Three rushing touchdowns in the American Championship game. He has to be a factor with his feet. Matt told us he's a man. He enjoys contact. He will not be shying away from it. Third down and one. From the 34 of LSU. Speaking of which, here's Matt taking on some people. Staying on his feet after contact. And he has the first down. Jacoby Stevens. Finally able to bring them down, down to 25. And this is the biggest difference we talked about with this offense from Milton to Mack. Milton rolling the ball downfield with accuracy and big plays. Mack is going to grind it out. They're still going to play with the same tempo. He doesn't have that accuracy as much down the field, but he will make you feel him in between the tackles. Here's Greg McRae. Try the left side on for size. McRae, no problem. Touchdown. Picked up an excellent block from the wide receiver, Gabriel Davis. And UCF jumps out on top. Speed to the edge by McRae. And blocking on the edge from those wide receivers. Hard to simulate. Take a look at Snelson, number five. Coming in and blocking on Grant Delpit. Gets a hold of that jersey. Got away with a hold. Official didn't see it in McCray. Arizona, quite the start. It's one way to shake off a hangover <laughs> after New Year's Eve. A frenetic start indeed to this one. LSU opened with a 79-yard kick return. Had to settle for a field goal. And the Knights of UCF fly down the field and get the touchdown. Edwards Alaire who had that 79-yard kick return to open things. He'll take a knee. We'll go for the touchback. Look at our Chick-fil-A impact players. Here's Todd. Steve, I think you start with the running backs for LSU. 
Obviously, Edwards Allaire is part of that group, and he's great in the Wildcat, which gave UCF issues against Memphis last time out. Also, you've got Brissett at the running back position. He, Nick Brissett has really been the workhorse this year. Over 220 touches, can catch the ball out of the backfield. It's going to be interesting to watch the matchup against those linebackers for UCF, specifically Nate Evans, who's second on the team with 90 tackles. And yet the running back in the game right now, of course, is Leonard Fournette. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> A wealth of talent. Riches everywhere you look. Jamar Chase on the receiving end from Joe Burrow. And a penalty. Let's see if they got him for the face mask. Be interesting to see how LSU approaches this early in this game. They want to run the football, as Todd said, and be physical, but they know they need to score points, Steve. So Joe Burrow is going to have to make plays in a passing game. Personal foul, face mask. Number 14, defense. 15-yard penalty and an automatic first down. That's Navelle Clark. And say hi to Stuart Mullins, our referee today from the ACC. I think Joe Burrow is going to be a little short-handed at the receiver position. No Jonathan Giles, their slot receiver, suffered a concussion in bowl practice and unable to go today. 14 on the play, 15 on the penalty. Gain of 29, they're already across midfield. Here's Burrow, strong pocket to step up and into. Try to go to Justin Jefferson. Brandon Moore, they call him Bam. He had the excellent coverage. Really nice job by Brandon Moore. He's in tight man-to-man -man coverage. Jefferson, the best and most consistent wide receiver for LSU, but that is blanket coverage from Brandon Moore. You know that Steve Ensminger, after watching a play like that, dials up the double move or the deep shot to get him off the curl route. going to keep it and he is taken down the big shoulder pads of Brendan Hayes Burrow's been running a ton probably more than they want him to he took a big shot there this is exactly what UCF wants to have happen two deep man under coverage and they run the football great stunt there by Hayes and if you think Hayes isn't fired up playing in this game his mom is an LSU alum he's from New Orleans Louisiana from and where's the number six for the sixth ward in Katrina. Five minutes in with third and ten. Here's Burrow to throw. Steps up in a nice pocket. And a beautiful ball on the money to Justin Jefferson. First down yardage. They'll move the chains. Been really impressed with Joe Burrow. Watching him in practice this week. Watch him step up in the pocket and then identify the coverage and anticipate that throw. That is as good as you can do it on that deep out. To Jordan Jefferson. On Monday. Mentioned on Monday. Burrow running the football more than they probably would like. He ran 29 times in that Texas A&M game in the seven overtimes. LSU still hasn't gotten over that. You know that 24-hour <laughs> rule? Forget about it. That one, that loss has lingered, people. First and ten on the ground. It's Brosset who came in needing 78 yards to get to 1,000 on the season time. Burrow said he was so exhausted after that 29 rushing performance of seven overtime that he went in, and he actually passed out. They had to give him IV, IV to get him back up and going, and the, the entire team had to wait for him because he was in the locker room, passed out, and they were getting medical attention. Those rush attempts, that was the most by an LSU quarterback, Reese, going back to 1943. Steve Van Buren <laughs> carried the ball 43 times. You need an IV too if you play that. <laughs> I don't think they had the overtime rule back then either. Here's Brosette. Cuts it upfield. He submarine and goes flying over Richie Grant, the vocal leader on that back end for UCF. You really can't underestimate how much that loss meant to this LSU team because it took a lot out of them emotionally, physically. They needed that time off before this bowl game. Little tempo here for LSU. On the ground, Brosette trying to push the pile on third and two, and he will get there. This is exactly how LSU wants offense, offensively to attack this football game. A couple of throws to start the drive, loosen up the defense, but then control the line of scrimmage with their offensive line. Two of their best linemen, Cushenberry and Damian Lewis, the center and right guard, need to take over this game. And Ed Orgeron 
says the most important thing is controlling the time of possession, not giving UCF as many possessions on offense. Cushenberry and Lewis, the only offensive line players to start every game for LSU this season. Here's first down and 10 from the 18. Burrow hands it off to Brosette for a few. Pat Chizinski, the first player in for UCF. Got to get the jitters out, both teams. The, yes, the ball, big time game, a lot of nerves. Now you get in this situation after the two series on offense for LSU. Last time down, they weren't able to punch the ball into the end zone. I think they realized that red zone efficiency on offense and scoring points is going to be a big key to this game. This is the ninth play of the drive. It started from their own 25. Burrow tried to go underneath and could not hook up with Derek Dillon. Richard Causey made sure of that. We've seen a couple of times already in this game where UCF, their defensive backs, have been all over these routes. Brandon Moore was all over Jordan Jefferson, and that time Rashad Causey, who arguably is the best cover man on this defense from the nickel position, able to get over Dillon. Third down and eight. Pressure coming, and it's picked off! It's Brandon Moore! Joe Burrow threw it right to him! And Brandon Moore down the sideline! Nobody to beat, and there are no flags! 93 yards, and the flag comes in late as Burrow was still on the ground. Nate Evans was chirping him, giving him the business, but that touchdown should stand as Burrow remains on his back. 93 yards for the score. Guys, Joey Connors, number 91 for UCF, took advantage as most defenders do when there's an interception. He looked up Burroughs, found him, and absolutely knocked him out. It was a huge shot down the left sideline. It's important, Todd, to, to know that that was a legal shot. He did not hit him in the head or neck area. That's a defenseless player by definition, but a really poor route from Derek Dillon. Outside Brandon Moore, understanding the route, short route. Dylan doesn't get the depth, doesn't get the separation. And then Joe Burrow needs to understand what the coverage is. It's too deep, and Moore's going to be out there. You just can't throw the ball blind out to the flat in that coverage. UCF has now forced a turnover in 32 consecutive games. To give you an idea how fascinating that streak is, the next closest team in the country is Indiana with 18 consecutive games forcing a turnover. That's 32 straight now for UCF as Burrow is attended to. We're going back to look at this block. They're reviewing this hit. Again, Joe Burrow by definition is a defenseless player in these blindside blocks. Now, the question is, did Connor's helmet make contact in a forcible manner to the head or neck area of Joe Burrow. And to me, it looked like that helmet hit him in the shoulder and chest area. I agree. Now, it's a lot more sensitive, and you see why Ed Orgeron is, is hot, because it's obviously a quarterback. You see they're showing it on the big screen. See if, see if the helmet of or any part of Joey Connors gets in that head or neck area. It's certainly up there, but. Joey Connors took full advantage. What a, what a, a change of momentum here for UCF. You come in, everybody's saying you don't belong with the After big After review, the ruling on the field stands. You don't belong with the big boys. You don't have the speed, the size. And they come in, they go right down the field on offense, score a touchdown. They've gotten a couple of stops now in back-to-back -back drives defensively in the red zone. And we've roughed up this LSU team early. Matthew Wright 
on to attempt the extra point. And boots it through. 6.39 to go in the first. UCF with a 14-3 lead. Let's go back to that interception, Steve. Two things happen here. First of all, this is a two deep, okay, man under defense. And in this situation, the quarterback, Joe Burrow, has to know you cannot throw the ball out here to the outside because that guy's not going anywhere. Brandon Moore's not going anywhere in that defense. That play is dead from the start. Now, that being said, Brandon Moore, I think, got away with the hold on the outside. Look at him and his right hand gets on top of Derek Dillon right there. The official misses it, and it's a big play interception return for the touchdown. You know, at first glance, you're wondering how is Dillon so far out of the play? Why would Burrow throw it right to the defender? Well, you can see why. On the ground, it is a lair. And Neville Clark will pop him backwards. Good to see Joe Burrow back. We know he's a tough guy. Junior from the Plains, Ohio. Transferred out of Ohio State after a couple of seasons. Sitting behind Dwayne Haskins. No, I'm not surprised he's back out. This, this kid's a competitor. He's tough. Tough player, and you get out there, you get a little cut on your chin, it looks like he had. Right back out. If anything, that'll sharpen your focus, I no, would no think. No question. He's got their attention, <laughs> to say the least. Second down and eight. For LSU, across the middle. It's a beautiful ball on the money to Stephon Sullivan for a game of 15. I really like that from Joe Burrow, and I like that call from Steve Ensminger. Get your quarterback back in the game. You know your protection is going to be good. Call a seven-step drop, let him step up and fire down the middle. Here's Burrow to throw. Now he'll escape the pocket. Has some green in front of him if he wants it. And he does. Bit of a late shot there. Indeed, it was late. It's Brandon Moore who just picked him off for the longest interception return in Fiesta Bowl history. The fourth longest interception return in UCF history. And Moore wasn't there. There is no foul for late hit out of bounds. Oh boy. We'll pick up, they'll pick up the flag. <laughs> I thought Brandon Moore got away with one on the hold interception return for a touchdown. Now he got away with another one. Here, that's clearly out of bounds. And clearly he makes contact. It's the right call by the official on the field. Trust yourself. That's the right call. Wow, that's not even close. Clearly on the out of bounds white. Brandon Moore's having the best 2019 yes. of anybody. <laughs> the breaks uh, going UCF's way early on. No doubt. First down and 10. They pick up the hanky. On the ground, Edward Zolaire, loss of three. Eric Mitchell came up from his weak side linebacker spot. When LSU goes two, halfbacks, a tight end, and two wide receivers, UCF is going to play their 4-3 defense. They're going to have three linebackers on the field. Jasinski, Evans, their starters, and then Eric Mitchell is going to come in as well. That's not their base defense, but against the heavy personnel of LSU, Eric Mitchell, number 12, is going to need to impact this football game. Pushed back to the 41. Second and 12. Burrow with time. And that throw is knocked away. Look at it go to Justin Jefferson. And Neville Clark had the coverage. No separation at all. Third time that we've seen. And it's been Causey, it's been Moore, and now Neville Clark. And this is pretty simple, the adjustment that needs to happen for LSU. You need to take the top off the coverage because they are sitting on everything. This feels like a big play in this game. Third down and 12 for LSU. LSU has tall receivers. Steven Sullivan, 6'7", D. Anderson, 6'6". Throw it up there, getting a the chance to go get it. Here comes some pressure for UCF. They're going to get there. Able to get home for the sack. And the ball comes out late. Randy Charlton, the true freshman from Miami, who's really come on the last five games of the season. He's there for the sack. After the play was over, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 58, defense his first of the game 15 yard penalty first down that's charlton too this is a chip you would think this was an in-conference game but these teams meet every year 
That's where you're going to see the safety. Kyle Gibson comes in. He's the one ultimately that's going to get to the quarterback. And you get a big stop. Your UCF, all the momentum is in your favor. And you get a true freshman that just doesn't, not thinking there. He's got the ball in his hand, spikes it on the ground, and you give him a first down. The emotion we were talking yeah. about with, with UCF and Randy Shannon. He's got a lot of young players on his defense that he's coordinating. And sometimes it's a roller coaster of emotion with them. That's his challenge early in this game. Excitable college kids. Here's Nick Brossette straight ahead. Richie Grant made the stop. Second down inside the 30 yard line. UCF. This is an unfamiliar position for LSU. They'd only given up 22 points in the first quarter all season. They allowed only two touchdowns in the first quarter. One to Alabama and one to Texas A&M. And here UCF has put two touchdowns on them already. We talk about the roller coaster for UCF defensively, and there's no nobody on that roller coaster more than Tristan Hill, number nine, who just jumped off sides. Offside with contact. Defense. Five-yard penalty, second down. And Hill's probably their most talented defensive player, Steve. Yeah. But, but he just hasn't been consistent enough this year. He was second team All-American Conference a year ago. He absolutely wrecked Memphis in the ACC AAC Please reset the game, game clock to 319. You know, Randy Three. Shannon told us yesterday, he goes, these guys get off, you know, some of them get hot in the first quarter, some get hot in the second quarter. You don't hear that associated with defensive linemen. But a quarterback gets hot. Yeah. You don't hear defensive linemen, they get hot. Gets hot in the second quarter. That seems like such an odd statement, but that speaks to the inconsistency. Four penalties so far on UCF for 50 yards. Second and one. Here's Brosette dancing, dancing too much. Novell Clark able to come up and make the stop. It'll be a third and short. Well, two drives for LSU and two failed red zone attempts. They had to kick a field goal in the first, and then the interception return for a touchdown in the second. Now they're on that red zone fringe, third and short. If I'm Ed Orgeron, Steve Ensminger, I might think about a play action deep shot here on third and short, knowing you might go for it on fourth down to get the momentum back in this football game. Four tackles for loss so far by this UCF defense. Third and one, Joe Burrow, what are you going to do? Gives it to Brosette, and he's going to be stopped again for another loss. Richie Grant, the first man in, fifth tackle for a loss, and we've still got two minutes left in the first quarter. You mentioned that Richie Grant came up from his safety position, and a very conservative call. I think if you were going to go for it on fourth down like they are now, why not take a shot on third and short? Now you're talking my language, Beats. Fourth down and one, going for it. Straight on the ground, it's Brosette, and he won't. Let's see. He just got across the line. Joey Connors had him by his ankles and got to him too late. It is a first down. Great a effort by Connors, play. yeah. But not by much. And if Connors doesn't make that tackle, Steve, Brosette is in the end zone. There were no linebackers and no safeties. As you can see right there, there's a big hole left for Brosette. Great effort by both gentlemen. Connors is the player who laid out Burrow earlier in the game. Joe showing no ill effects to this point. That's great to see. First down and 10. At the UCF 22. Burrow to throw. Now he'll take a shot. Lops one for Jefferson. He's got it. Touchdown. What a throw. What a catch. 22 for the score. Third and short or first and ten doesn't matter. As long as you take the shot and you make it. What a throw from Joe Burrow. What a comeback from him after getting interception return for a touchdown. Knocked on the ground. That ball could not have been walked out there any better. And Jordan Jefferson, who's been their most consistent receiver all year, secures that catch. The Tigers were able to collect their breath for just a moment now. Settle back into things. Cole Tracy puts it through. And it's a 14-10 game. And what a start up, on New Year's Day. <laughs>
You're right. Joe Burrow, this feels like he's lived an entire game already. We're not they got to get some rhythm going offensively. They've only had six plays in this game because of the interception return for a touchdown and two long drives by LSU. They just haven't been on the field. Coming up on the final minute of the first quarter. It's Taj McGowan. Patrick Queen came up to make the stop. Reese, I don't think I've mentioned Devin White's name on, oh, yeah. a, on a single play. 60 seconds to go. The flag comes out. Let's see. They looked like they were set offensively. Full start. Offense. There was no time when all the 11 players were set prior to the snap. Five-yard penalty. First down. It's going to be a big key watching this entire game is that tempo that Josh Heifel loves to ramp up. Said it's one of his biggest weapons, and especially against a undermanned LSU defense. You want to tire out those defensive linemen. Here's Mack to throw. And a complete. He completes the pass. Wouldn't better off dropping it. It's a loss. Kuli Biali is the tight end. And he makes the grab. And the danger of going so fast, we say this, it seems like, with every up-tempo offense, is if you don't get that first down, all you're doing is going fast right back to the bench, and you're putting your defense back out on the field. So it's a loss on the completion. Second and 16. Back to throw again. Down the sideline. Gabriel Davis, the intended target, but you could see that flag coming from a mile away on Terrence Alexander. Terrence Alexander, last we saw him, was struggling against Texas A&M. And Pass Kendrick Rogers, number 11, defense, 15-yard penalty, and an automatic first down. And for UCF today with Gabe Davis on one side, Trey Nixon on the other, Dredrick Snelson in the slot along with Adrian Killens. Uh, you're going to have opportunities to throw the ball down the field. The question is, can Daryl Mack be consistent and accurate enough to make those plays on a consistent enough basis in this ball game? That, that ball there was well thrown. Ten seconds left in the quarter. That's Greg McRae. And Mack will keep it. And the ball comes out. Turnover. LSU able to recover. It's Michael DeVinti. Devin White makes the play to force the ball out. And DeVinti... His seatmate on the airplane able to recover the fumble. It's been an issue for Daryl Mack. Three fumbles in the first half of the AAC championship game. Lost two of them. Almost gave that game away. And one of the first times he's run the football in this game, Devin White, knowing that he has ball security issues, the first thing you do as a linebacker is you tackle the football. And that's exactly what happened. Let's check this marker. After the play was over, personal foul, number 11, LSU, throwing a punch. He is disqualified from the game. Wow. 15-yard penalty, first down, LSU, after recovery of the fumble. Already down would be their three best cornerbacks. Terrence Alexander will be shown the door. There he is over here. He's in, locked up with Gabe Davis. Yeah, and I mean, I, I just, man, we say this time and time again of watching college football is these guys, you throw a punch, you're automatically going to be thrown out of the game. And that's just selfish behavior by Terrence Alexander, but an even bigger blunder from Daryl Mack. We talked to Mack about it yesterday. I asked him point blank. I said, have you done anything to work on, on fumbling issues? Have you had fumbling issues in the past going back to high school? He said, no, it's never been an issue. It was a one-time deal. The three, three fumbles against Memphis. Yeah, and I asked him, what are you going to do to try to fix it? He said, tighten up the rock. The problem, Todd, is they don't practice that, right? You, you don't hit quarterbacks right. in practice. And when you're a running quarterback, you can't practice it. Off the turnover, the quick change. It's Edwards Allaire. And as the quarter comes to an end, my question in addition would be, why do you want to punch somebody in the face mask? You, Eric Reed, Jamal Adams, Morris Claiborne, Trudavis Trude Trude White, I mean, and now they have no corners left. Here's Burrow. Going to take off and allow first down yardage. And a last thought on Alexander. The kid is a senior. That's how his college career will come to an end. 
on a play like that. Transferred from, transferred from Stanford just to play. Kid out of New Orleans. Turned down a six-figure job from a cybersecurity firm in San Francisco. So you know he's a bright kid. And he makes a bad mental and physical mistake there. First down and 10 after the Burrow run. Looks to throw, and he was lucky he put that football away. Eric Mitchell was looking to take it away from him. What a nice play by Eric Mitchell off the edge. Being blocked by the tight end Moreau. This is not a starter on this UCF defense, but he's getting a lot of playing time based off of this style of offense for LSU, and that's his second tackle for loss in this first half. Reese, I, I have not been able to sit down yet. I mean, that's the kind of first quarter it was. As we get into early second quarter action, what a start. What a bowl game to begin. Mighty LSU out of the mighty SEC against the perfect Knights of UCF out of the American Conference. Edward Zolaire, who opened with a 79-yard kick return on the receiving end there. Nate Evans forced him out of bounds. Third down. I think one of the really impressive and surprising things early in this game that jump out to me, everybody's talking about this UCF defense and how poor they've been this season. Yes, they've given up a ton of yards, averaging 423 yards given up, and a lot on the ground, over 225. But they have been taking it to this offensive line for LSU early in this game, getting penetration and getting to Joe Burrow. Third down and seven, just across midfield. Here's some pressure from UCF. It's picked up nicely. Throw across the middle. Floated in there for Dillon. Down the sideline. Derek Dillon for the score. A play that looked like nothing turns into something. A 49-yard touchdown. And LSU back on top. Well, Derek Dillon was the culprit in the interception return for a touchdown. Joe Burrow doesn't give up on him. He beats the linebacker. A terrible attempt at a tackle from Richie Grant. He gets a, a block from Jamar Chase. Kobe Stevens, strong safety at the pressure. Third down. The rest of the formation here, UCF going fast. Normally they want to throw that ball to Otis Anderson behind that offensive line, but the numbers didn't equate. And again, UCF, just like the last drive, in third and long after a quick three plays. Third and 15. LSU threatening some pressure. Here's Netherly right here. You would want to target him, but LSU's going to protect him. Here's the blitz. Rushing five. Mack able to get out of there for the time being anyway. And did he get it away in time? Devin White was chasing him down. Incomplete pass. He was very close to the sideline being forced out of bounds with the football. And they got man-to-man -man coverage and didn't look like Mack was able to find a receiver downfield. And once you start running as a quarterback, you know number 40 and white is going to hunt you down. That speed to the edge is unlike any other linebacker I've seen this year. And that's one of the reasons you win the Buckus Award. As the best linebacker in college football. Mac Loudermilk. And all that salad and lettuce coming out of his helmet. He'll boot it away from his 10. Justin Jefferson will let it bounce. And it takes a UCF bounce in a big way. All the way back to the 22. Up next, Urban Meyer. His final game as head coach of the Buckeyes. He'll take on Washington in the Rose Bowl game. Presented by Northwestern Mutual. And then it's... 15th ranked Texas and number five Georgia in the All-State Sugar Bowl. You can stream that game and every game on the ESPN app with ESPN Plus. I can't wait to see that Washington Huskies defensive backfield. That's one of the best, I think, in all of college football against Dwayne Haskins, Paris Campbell and company. You know, that, that defense has only given up nine touchdown passes all season. And I think Haskins has like 47. It will be another great day in college football. They flip it to Jefferson. Thought he might want to throw it for a second. But he'll take the big loss. Titus Davis. 
And we got to get out of here quickly after the game. I want to watch Haskins going against that that secondary, that defense of, uh, of Washington. He, to me, has become the number one quarterback prospect in this year's class. I, I just think he's a pure passer. He got better as the season progressed, and he's played his best in the biggest games. Today's a great challenge for him, though. He's not going to see that man-to-man -man coverage, Todd, no, like no. he did against Michigan. It's going to be all zone. Jimmy Lake, their defensive coordinator, going to try to confuse him. It's because of Haskins, Joe Burrows playing quarterback at LSU now. That's a win-win. Across the middle, Stephon Sullivan making people miss. Out beyond the 35-yard line. Richie Grant brought him down. And the linebacker comes right through the middle, and Joe Burrow is smart enough to know you throw the ball where the blitz comes from. That's where the vacated area was, and that's the perfect spot for the crossing round. Now let's give the punter love. Mac Laddermilk didn't give credit, got a, a nice roll, but it goes for a punt of 58 yards to back LSU up. 19 on that last play. Tigers with the football, up three, 11 to go. First half, PlayStation Fiesta Bowl from Glendale on this New Year's Day 2019. It's Kyle Gibson the stop on Edwards Alaire. You know, the biggest thing that Ed, Ed Orgeron said yesterday, and and all the coaches really echoed it is time of possession. You don't hear that very often in coaches' meetings anymore. Everyone's spread and tempo these days, but they kept saying, we've got to own the time of possession. So far, about three and a half minutes for UCF, LSU has dominated the football. And it's interesting, Todd. They've done it primarily moving the ball through the air. They've got 142 yards through the air and only 47 on the ground. CF showed blitz there. Burrow might have audibled out of it. Second and six. Good pocket. Able to, let's see, did he get it down? His foot down? Got one down. Jamar Chase, the true freshman. His second grab. Gain of nine. This is a great throw from Joe Burrow because Titus Davis is right underneath Chase. And that ball's thrown high and a great job by Chase to get his feet down. You see this angle, that is not the kind of angle you want to throw into as a quarterback, knowing that Titus Davis has underneath of that out route, but Joe Burrow made it work. On the straight dropbacks by Burrow, the pocket's been excellent. No doubt. UCF really has not gotten pressure, yet they have five tackles for loss in the game so far. Majority of the running plays. Quick screen. Able to get it out to Edwards Allaire. Novell Clark made the stop. UCF has not been able to get pressure without bringing blitzers. They have gotten a couple of sacks. Kyle Gibson, the safety, came and got a sack. And then Eric Mitchell, a will linebacker. But they've had to bring extra pressure to get to Burrow. That leaves them vulnerable in the secondary. Burrow has completed six in a row. He's got the Tigers on the move. On the plus side of the field. Second and two. Burrow gives it to Edwards Alaire. He spun around, taken down for a loss by Pat Jasinski. They call him Savage Pat. He hates that nickname. They still call him that anyway. Boy, filled that hole. Third and two, they go fast. It's Edwards Alaire able to slither his way through the hole and have first down yardage. Give credit to Steve Ensminger. He's he's mixing his tempos. He's getting in the huddle. Then in certain situations when the when the personnel dictates what he likes, the, the matchup of his offensive personnel on the field against the personnel for UCF, he'll go fast, especially in short yarded situations. I think Ensminger has grown into this role as the season has gone on with this personnel. Sullivan in motion, bottom of your screen. Burrow looking to the left. Took a shot up high, able to get out of there. Now he'll throw, and it is juggled, and let's see if they call it a catch. They're going to say, no, he juggled it out of bounds. Terrence Marshall was the intended target. Excellent pressure that time by UCF, Randy Charlton. Yeah, we talked about it. Bringing extra defenders. There comes a linebacker, Jasinski. Charlton gets a hand up there. But equally as good, the pressure of at the 23 of UCF. There's Burrow to throw. 
across the middle. Able to hit Edwards Alaire out of the backfield. There is a flag down, staying on his feet as the Knights swarm to the ball, led by Collier. Check the flag. Holding offense, number 77. Ten-yard penalty, first down. Sadiq Charles, the second time he has been flagged on the afternoon. Well, and LSU fans are wincing because Sadiq Charles has been a, one of the issues up front for this offensive line. They've been pretty solid in the middle, but left tackle has been a real issue. And Sadiq Charles going up against the true freshman, Charlton, and he gets that hand around and then he torques him down. That's a good call. It's just you can't do that in that situation as a tackle. You just need to push that defensive end up and around the quarterback rather than taking him to the ground. Kenny Stunier has checked into the game for UCF. For the end zone, touchdown, Justin Jefferson. What a throw by Joe Burrow. Second touchdown catch. That one's good for 33 yards and the six. Joe Burrow buys the time and allows Jordan Jefferson to get behind the defense. It's a breakdown from UCF on the back end. The first time Kyle Gibson, their safety, goes out of the game, Steve, the first thing you want to do is attack the safety, and that's exactly what LSU did. Cole Tracy on to kick the extra point. He was perfect, 38 for 38. Thankfully, he makes that one after that mention. 10-point LSU lead after they trailed 14-3 early. Here's the safety right here. Both of these safeties, okay? And you got Jefferson on the outside. This safety is going to go up. That's Richie Grant. He's covering the corner route, and in miscommunication with the corner on the outside, either the corner has to stay with Jefferson or the safety has to bump back, neither of which happened. Joe Burrow buys a little bit of time, shuffles in the pocket, and great awareness to get the ball downfield for the touchdown. Guys, you know, you have to go back probably five or six years since LSU had a legitimate number one big-time receiver, and Jefferson's emerged as that guy. I mean, he came into the game with 50 catches. No other receiver on the roster had more than 20. So he's become the reliable target for Burrow. And he is just a sophomore. Future is bright. Seven and a flag. Boy, this could be another targeting situation. Very dangerous situation. Personal foul. Targeting. Number nine, defense. The play is under review. Wow. So Nelson gets the again. ball, yeah, and he's getting he's getting tackled underneath, and uh, then his head's yep. coming down. Now Delpit's coming up there to make a play. He's coming up there to tackle a receiver, and Snelson is coming down to the ground. This is almost impossible. First down. I, I have never seen a faster review. They took about five seconds to make this call. Yeah, and Coach O's trying to tell him, listen, wrap him, wrap him. That is, that's very difficult. Coach O played, he played close to the line of scrimmage. These defensive backs are under so much pressure, and anytime you get that crown going, then, then it's an easy call, and you see what the impact today. Here's Mack. Hey, Grace, you don't have to be in football your entire life to, to know this should open up the passing game for UCF. Well, well the, 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 this is this is the challenge for Josh Heupel and, and for Daryl Mack. Daryl Mack has completed three passes in this game. He, I know he's a running quarterback. I know this is just his third start in college football. But for them to win this game, he's going to have to throw it. Trying to throw it there. Trying to hang on to the football for dear life. Jacoby Stevens gets to him. Well, Dave Aranda knows that his secondary is, is under pressure. So why not rush? A linebacker size guy and Jacoby Stevens on Adrian Killens who can't block. He's 180 pounds. He's a receiver. That's a mismatch. So credit Dave Aranda. Despite the losses he's had, he's going to bring more pressure, not allow a young quarterback to beat him throwing. Third and 16. You can see the wide splits too. There's Josh Heupel offense a lot like Baylor's. They're going to isolate these corners on the perimeter. From some late pressure, it's picked up. Mack has a clean pocket to throw from. It's Gabriel Davis, but he's short of the marker. 
Manny Netherly had the coverage. Devin White there as well. Yeah, this is what you got to do. And Netherly, you know, he hasn't played a whole lot out there. Gabe Davis going for it on fourth down. Going for it. It's batted up in the air. And it will fall heartlessly down to the turf. So on fourth down, going for it. What would have been a very long field goal try. Under 50, but still, no field goal attempt there. That's well, the area of the field where Josh Heupel loves to be aggressive, and a lot of offenses like to be aggressive. And I can't fault him for this decision. It would have been a long field goal attempt when he had an open receiver in Colobiale. But really nice job on that drive by Jacoby Stevens. He got the sack, and then when he wasn't able to get to the quarterback, recognized it, got up in his hands on the football, playing in place of Grant Duncan. That would have been a 48-yard field goal attempt for Matthew Wright, who does have a 50-yarder to his credit at UConn, on the road at UConn, hit it a couple of years ago. So they turn it over on downs to LSU. And it's Brosette who has swallowed up for a loss of three, led by Brendan Hayes. You get the feeling now it's a 10 point game, 10 point lead for LSU and this UCF team. And they've gotten down in situations like they did against Memphis. What really got them back into the football game was this defense turning the football over. They already had one interception return for a touchdown in this one. They sure could use another turnover here. Second and 12. Here's Burrow. Pressure up the middle. They'll get rid of it. And it goes for an incomplete pass. Nate Evans had the coverage on Edwards Alaire. So if time of possession was so critical before the game started, it's become even more important now for LSU because they're so beaten up on the back end on defense. It's, this, this game has gone according to what Ed Orger wanted to do. 19 and a half minutes of possession for them and only six and change for UCF. Outside of the one interception return for a touchdown, LSU has played flawlessly in this game. Third and 12. From their own 29. Timeout. UCF, their first of the half. 32nd, timeout. Penalties have played a critical role in this game. And they had to stop on third down, UCF did, and then Charlton spikes the ball, gives them another first down, and Joe Burrow and company make them pay with the Jefferson to the end zone. And I still think the biggest, the biggest surprise here is this is a, a UCF offense that came into the game scoring 44 points a game. And they've been held to seven points here in the first half, despite all of the eight starters and now another starter, nine, yes. for Grant Delpit being out of this game. That's the story. We've seen three players kicked out of the game already. It's been a wild start, a game that saw UCF jump on top 14 to 3, and LSU has roared back. But they want to keep the football because they are so banged up now on defense. It's a good thing this is the last game of the season for these two. Some bodies need some healing. Burrow just dumped that away. Joey Connors trying to chase him down. And it's fourth down. UCF is getting the football back. That was a must stop there for UCF. They didn't get the turnover, but that was a must stop to give their offense at least one more opportunity here with four minutes and six seconds left before halftime to get some momentum back in this game. Zach Von Rosenberg is back to punt. First time LSU has punted. Otis Anderson back deep for UCF. Signals the fair catch. And there's contact. And that's Devin White. The all-world player for LSU. 46-yard punt. He hasn't had a chance to hit Anderson yet. He just Kick catch interference, hi. number 40, kicking team. 15-yard penalty, first down. Now granted, it's a love tap, but it still counts. Discipline has been an issue here in the first half, Chris Cotter. 
tackling is an issue for Iowa. Caden Fry's watching this play and he's shouting, Bloom and Onion, can somebody please tackle Nick Fitzgerald in the Outback Bowl? Now he's got some blockers in front of him to get it. 33 yards to the score. Very entertaining over on ESPN 2. Mississippi State by two. All right, Chris. UCF trailing by 10. Four minutes to play in the half. They've got the football to start with great field position. Out at their own 38-yard line. Mack underneath the Killens. Doesn't get back to the line of scrimmage. Patrick Queen forced him out. Remember, Adrian Killens was the player a year ago who said Auburn hasn't seen the kind of speed we have. They're in for a rude awakening, and that got a whole lot of people's attention. Uh, he didn't say anything the sort about LSU. Sort of backtracked away from that angle this time around. Here's Mack being chased down, tripped up, tried to throw it away as he was in the air. Patrick Queen got to him, and there's the flag. That'll be intentional grounding. You can almost see. Just for grounding. Number eight, offense. Spot foul, loss of down. Third down. You can almost see Daryl Mack, a young Daryl Mack, thinking through this game, right? Trying to throw the ball downfield, then pressure gets to him. Then he realizes, oh no, I got to get rid of the ball. He's outside of the pocket, but that ball has to get back to the line of scrimmage. And another drive looks like it's going to be foiled for UCF. I don't, I don't, I don't think Josh Heifel should get into any tight situations. Mackenzie Milton can handle these pressures. He can diagnose them and hurt you with his arm. Daryl Mack is not there right now. Spot foul, the loss of down. All the way back to the 13. It's Greg McCray, the ball carrier. Rashard Lawrence makes the stop for LSU. Very smart by Ed Orgeron, knowing he can take his timeout, use his timeouts, and give his quarterback, Joe Burrow, who is uh, hot, another opportunity before half. Fourth down, they'll get the football, take this 56 to 41. So he has shown the abilities, and in that game they were behind. Now that was Memphis, I get it. Animal. I get Which it, Which I think Greece. is the argument from people around college football, right. right? But he was down 17 in his second career start and able to lead the team back from behind. Yep. Different animal, I get it. This is LSU, and this is the SEC, and that's the point. Yep. That, that's, that's the big picture point. That's why we're here today, Steve, yes. to answer these questions. It's the game inside the game. I'll tell you what, the quarterback that's playing best right now is number nine for LSU. In the last two games, Joe Burrow has six touchdown passes, three of them in this first half. He's on fire. First down and ten for LSU. Got the one timeout left. Here's Burrow off the play fake. And he will throw sideline. Jefferson cuts it in. And he'll be stopped short of midfield by Antoine Collier. Aerial coverage is provided by Goodyear from kickoff to the final whistle. Hard work never gives up. Goodyear, more driven. What if, what if Boomer used to call this place? The Big Toaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily aesthetically pleasing from the outside, but you love I this love place. It. I love it. This is one of my favorite places to play because you have the, the grass, which is nice and soft, but perfect conditions on the inside. Here's Burrow to throw. Little slant to Jamar Chase, who has definitely been a weapon. He's inside the 40, stopped by Richie Grant. It's a gain of 15. The true freshman's been very good. LSU coming into this game. You know, some questions about their offense. They had a great game against Texas A&M, but uh, they come in averaging a little under 400 yards of offense and 31 points. And so far, they have... They have it all going, 271 yards in the first half, and they're going for more points here. They might get 30 before halftime. No pressure at all. Burrow has all sorts of time, and then misfires, looking for Justin Jefferson. Pat Jasinski came over and had the coverage. So this is the real grass played inside a domed stadium, which makes it so unique. Uh, this surface is being played on for just the second time. It was brand new for the Cardinals game last week. Let's just see some of the Cardinals uh, logos on the field, on the paint underneath. The kicker, Avery Atkins, we saw him slip earlier on that opening kick. So. Yeah. Well, so best of both worlds. You probably won every game here, Greece. That's well, why the Cardinals weren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're not very good this year either. <laughs> and their worst record since 2000, plus Steve Wilkes, his job. Here's Burrow. 
the throw down the sideline. Sullivan wants a flag. Thinks that he was hooked by Antoine Collier, but there is no penalty mark. I like that uh, approach there from, from Joe Burrow. Kyle Gibson, their starting safety out of the game. His replacement, Antoine Collier, you get Sullivan at 6'7", matched up on a safety. That's worth a shot, but if you're going to miss, miss short and allow Sullivan to go back up with that big body and make a play. Third down and 10. Ton of time left. It's still the one timeout. And a great kicker, maybe the best in college football on Cole Tracy. Pressure from the outside, Burrow. Feels it on the backside, lofts one. And too strong for Chase. Air mailed it, fourth down. Yeah, Jamar Chase ran this deep out that Joe Burrow really loves to throw. And he just doesn't see him in time. He's wide open here, but uh, Burrow is looking the other direction initially. By the time he gets back to Chase, who's wide open, the ball should be gone now. It's too late and out of bounds. Not only that, they didn't get any yards, so they can't attempt the field goal. But if I were them, I'd give Cole Tracy an opportunity. Josh Grouton is on to punt for the first time. And excellent coverage of the punt by Racy McMath. And UCF will start inside the five. Taco Bell is bringing the best of the regular season to the PlayStation Fiesta Bowl by creating the Taco Bell Live Mas student section. Tonight, they're picking up the tab for students from each school. So these passionate fans can root on their teams. They're picking up the tab. Who says no such thing as a free lunch? Go to town, kids. Who needs a shirt? It's a little chillier here in uh, Phoenix area than I was anticipating. It was a high of 45 degrees yesterday. I didn't quite have the correct wardrobe. Greasy brought a windbreaker. <laughs> it was raining and freezing in the desert. UFC with just 85 yards of offense. Trying to put something together in these last two minutes. It's Kalubiali, the tight end. Devin White brought him down. Michael Kalubiali, we told you, the sixth year senior, got a medical hardship that allowed him to play a sixth year. And the only member of this team that saw the 2014 Fiesta Bowl without buying a ticket. That's Nelson on the receiving end now. And a little bit of momentum from Mack in this UCF offense. UCF has two timeouts remaining. Now in some traffic, and he'll be dropped. Lawrence gets him. See this defensive line, this SEC defensive line. Richard Lawrence just goes right by the left guard Schneider. No chance for Mack. Mack will pick up a few. This is eating up valuable time. Valuable seconds coming off the clock. Down to a minute left in the half. UCF still with two timeouts remaining. It's third and nine. There's a flag. Bit of a free play. The ball comes out. UCF able to recover. Michael DeVinti, who picked up a fumble earlier in the game, really got that one. Rashard Lawrence. Offside. Number 90. Defense. Five yard penalty. Repeat the down. Never got back set on the other side. And it's part of what uh, the recipe is for UCF going fast. UCF's having a real issue blocking this defense line. We knew that. The only way. UCF can get back in this game and win it in the second half is to control this line of scrimmage better and really the only weapon that they have to do so is that tempo keep those guys on the field get first downs and wear them out so the pass rush isn't so severe two seconds on the play clock and they're looking over and on purpose they snap it directly to Greg McRae so they pull out a little wrinkle there UCF Thought they were going to burn a timeout. Yeah. Here's Mack. He was step and fire. And could not hook up with Trey Nixon. 
Boy, that's, transfer from Ole Miss. That's a throw and a catch you need to make in that situation. Have a little trickery just to run the football, you know, with the direct snap on a third down, and you get the first down, and then you have a 15-yard gain, and you miss the easy throw. They can throw the slant route up top here to Snelson anytime they want. It's an easy throw for Mack. He doesn't have to read a whole lot, and you get the ball in your playmaker's hands easily. Given this LSU time, defense time to catch their breath. Back to throw, across the middle. There it is, Gabriel Davis. There it is, two slants on the inside. Gabriel Davis and Snelson. John Battle is down. An injured player for LSU after the gain of 16. Tigers can ill afford to lose another defensive back. No question. I think this is something that, that UCF needs to do. Josh Heupel needs to call this going into the second half more. You see Snelson here, Davis here. This is where the ball needs to be thrown. It's an easy read, as I said. And when you look at it here, the ball is out. So look at these holes. Look at these holes on the inside. Because of the inexperience for LSU in the back end, you have to throw the football to win. And those are the easiest kinds of throws for Mack. At halftime, stay tuned for the Indeed Halftime Report. Reese and Desmond and David are standing by. The most glorious sight in the sports world at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. So Ed Paris checks in. I think they played every defensive back they have for LSU. As Battle comes out, we'll see how long he comes out for. He only has to miss one play. The only, the only good news is Ed Paris is a senior. He was uh, supposed to be the starter a couple of years ago, got hurt in preseason camp, so it's not like he's a, a true freshman. Jacob Phillips will get out of the locker room in the second half for LSU. The starting middle linebacker called for targeting in that Texas A&M seven overtime loss. So they will welcome him back with open arms. Clock is moving under 30 now. Back to throw. Set up the screen, and McCray turns the corner, gets a couple. Patrick Queen has been very impressive for that LSU defense. The clock is stopped at 17 yeah. seconds. Todd Harris lost his helmet, and so he's going to have to come out of the game. And good thing that John Battle wasn't too shaken up because he's coming back into the game. I think he's their only left safety they have left on the sideline. And hospital visits. 17 seconds left in the half. Here's Mack. Swallowed up by Rashard Lawrence. Again, his second sack. You know, he went to bed early last night. They call him Uncle Phil from the Fresh Prince. Goes to bed at 9.30 at night on a regular night. They tried to get the back matched up on that wheel route. It was Otis Anderson. Here he is. He's going to come out of the backfield. The problem is Mack doesn't have enough time. This defensive front is too good. Coming, there's Lawrence. He wants to throw the ball here, but the safety over the top prevents it. And the left tackle, Wyatt Miller, not able to block Lawrence. Greece, I feel like on these last five snaps, when you know UCF is throwing the football, they are still going play action. What is the point of faking to the back every single play when you see what's left on the clock, no timeouts left at this point in the game? It's a really good, that's a really good question, and it all has to do with how they set the protection. Okay, so protections are called one of two ways. You either have five linemen up front, or you have a back and a tight end that need to be incorporated into that. You might fake to a back so he can go to the other side of the field to protect that side. So you're not fooling the defense no. then at that point in the game. Here's Matt the throw. Steps up and fires back to the end zone. Davis is there for the touchdown. Gabriel Davis on the receiving end of a strike from Daryl Mack for 32 yards and the score. Gabriel Davis had six touchdowns this season, a lot of them just like this. Perfectly thrown football. You targeted Manny Nethery, who hasn't played any corner this season. And he comes down with one foot inbound for the touchdown. With four seconds left, the complexion of this bad boy has just changed. Matthew Wright, the extra point. UCF is down a field goal, and again, they will get the ball to start the second half. 
Like, where did that throw come from all of a sudden? They're just throwing it up, giving them a chance. Right? They tried it a little earlier in the game, but you need to do this at least four or five times a quarter, given the fact that LSU defensively is so undermanned. Otis Anderson just gets enough of a block on the edge to allow Mack the room to make that throw. It's been dominated by LSU. I think that's fair to say, but UCF is hanging around. Down three without their star quarterback. They come out running with Adrian Killens, and welcome to the game, Jacob Phillips. He was kicked out of that last game for targeting, therefore he missed the first half, and that last game, of course, was five weeks ago. The seven overtime loss against Texas A&M. Again, it's Killens with all that speed trying to turn the corner. No gain there. It'll be a third and three. Michael Divinity forced him out. So Killens, Killens needs to be a bigger part of this second half for UCF. In the first half, he only had three touches for one yard. They got to get him the football. He's their most explosive player. Third and two. Mack to try to throw for it. The slant inside. Cameron Lewis had the coverage, and Otis Anderson could not come up with the football. And it brings that, up a fourth and two. That looked like clear pass interference to me. I think it was Todd Harris, the safety. He's inside in the slot receiver, Otis Anderson. And watch his right hand way before the ball gets there. That should have been an easy pass interference call and a first down for UCF. UCF, they were on the punting unit on late. I was wondering if they were thinking about going for it from their own 33 to open up the second half. But it is louder milk. Standing back at his own 19. Booted away. Justin Jefferson is back deep. No fair catch. He'll take some contact and be dropped down at the 28. Take a look at tonight's Capital One rewarding performance. Joe Burrow had himself a game in that first half. Well, it didn't start well. Throws an interception, return for a touchdown. Gets laid out by a 315-pound defense alignment, but you know, there's one word you could use about Joe Burrow. It's tough. He's not going to back down. He stared down the barrel a couple more times. He got hit on a targeting ball again, but threw three touchdowns in that first half and really paced this LSU offense. First down and 10 from their own 27. With Nick Brosset to his left. He'll give it to Brosset. Able to squeeze through for a yard on the play. A.J. Wooten made the stop. Joe Burrow is trying to become the first quarterback to start a season for LSU to win 10 games. Zach Mettenberger did it. As LSU comes in 9-3 and three in action, and he'll have another season left of eligibility. Burrow will at LSU. Well, it's impressive what he's done. And you think back to the start of the year, they had questions with the quarterback. You didn't know who your go-to wide receiver was going to be. You had huge holes on the offensive line. Who's going to be the next running yes. back after Fournette and guys? And all they've done is continue to get better each and every week. Expectations were not high coming into the season. Timeout. How about this? LSU, their first of the half. A 30 second. A minute timeout. into the half. A minute and a half into the third quarter. LSU forced to burn a timeout. Well, not only that, is probably the biggest question they had was they were going with a recycled offensive coordinator and Steve Ensminger, and it didn't end well with Matt Canada. Lost a couple players to transfer the suspension. They get a couple of big wins. Again, you know, we found out later about Miami, but at the time, they were number eight. It was the loss to Florida. They beat Georgia and beat them handily, 36-16, to and then that seven-overtime game to Texas A&M in which they really believe they had one at the end of regulation. Well, and and I know that uh, Coach O has his opinion, but I thought it was pretty clear Kellen Mond's knee was down before he threw that ball. But I didn't agree necessarily with the pass interference call on Greedy Williams at the end on the two-point conversion. But either way, uh, they had a chance to win that game and, and allowed a and to hang around. But that's the kind of loss that will stick with you for a long time. Yeah, you know that 24-hour rule about after a win or a loss? Forget it. They still haven't forgotten that loss. Here's Burrow underneath to his tight end. Foster Morrow. Ability, so you better know if you bring a corner blitz like that that they're not going to run that ball right up the gut because it'll be a big gainer. First down and 10. 
Well, Seth still needs another 23 yards for 1,000. Here's Burrow to throw. Loads up and fires. Got a wide open man. Caught for the touchdown. Jamar Chase. 32 yards for the score. And a little breathing room for the Tigers. Well, Brandon Moore made one of the big plays in the interception return for a touchdown in the first half, but he makes a critical error here on the first drive. A double move by Jamar Chase. He just chops his feet and then goes to the end zone. And Coach O says, I want to be aggressive coming out the start of this second half, and they've done it to perfection. Offensive line for LSU, but they've continued to get better since that game. Greg McCray. The ball carrier, McCray, number one in the country in yards before contact. Usually 4.8 yards average before contact. Number one in the country. Think about that for a second. Here's Mack trying to run it up in there. That has a lot to do right, with this offensive line, yes. which is a very good offensive line for UCF playing in the American Conference, right? But but this is not the American Conference, and this is what everybody wanted to see. Here's the SEC, qualifier. SEC defensive line yes. against this offensive line, and so far, they haven't been able to run the ball with any kind of consistency. Back to throw, and it skips off the turf. Dredrick Snelson could not come up with it. And again, this is, this is sort of a defensive line for LSU. No yeah. Ed Alexander, right. no Neil Farrell, no Braden Fajoko. They, they've got Ja'Cory Savage, a, a backup offensive lineman, ready to go on the defensive line. Yep. So, again, we're not making excuses, but that's how short they are up front LSU. And down, what, six defensive backs? And, and this, is a back UC, yeah, this is a UCF team that set a program record for rushing yards in a season with over 3,300 this season, right? And they come into this game averaging over 250 yards, and they've got 60 in the first half. Bit of a high snap, Loudermilk able to bring it down. Justin Jefferson, the fair catch. Second three and out this quarter for UCF. Here's Chris Cotter in the studio. Okay, leaves this tie a bow on this Outback Bowl. Iowa up five with Mississippi State driving. The final minute of the game, Nick Fitzgerald trying to finish his career on a high note for Mississippi State does not. Despite the fact that Iowa only had negative 15 yards rushing in the game they hold on to win the outback bowl 27 22. meanwhile vrbo citrus bowl benny snell oh snell yeah she takes it in for kentucky right now they lead 20 to 7 in the third on abc very good Chris. thank you keep those updates coming lsu with their second possession the second half burrow on the ground that'll go for a loss Brendan Hayes, the first man there. He's a Louisiana native. Loss of one on the play. offense now this is twofold for UCF they want to score obviously but they want to keep that, that UCF offense off the field see if LSU can keep going with a drive to Nick Brosette Brosette dives forward to stay inbounds there the Bell Clark made the stop bring up third down I really enjoyed talking with Nick Brosette last night you know, he was uh, been here four years, but overshadowed. Came in the same year with two guys, Leonard Fournette and Darius Geis. You want to talk about being overlooked. And he's never wavered, never thought about transferring, biding his time. He's a physical back at 220 pounds and does anything that he's asked. Really good football player. 141 touchdowns in high school. That's still a Louisiana record for Nick Brosette on third and six. Burrow steps and fires, able to complete the chase. Who's become his go-to favorite target in this game, Jamar Chase. First down yardage. But Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson are wearing out this secondary for UCF. They come into this game they're wondering if this UCF defense can stop the running game, but it's really been the secondary that has been exploited along with Joe Burrow. Fresh set of downs, five minutes in a quarter, number three, and some flags fly. Full start, number 78, offense. 
Five-yard penalty, first down. That's Garrett Brumfield, who's among the smarter players on this LSU squad. Foster Morrow said if he was on Who Wants to Win a Million, uh, Be a Millionaire, and you got to phone a friend, I would phone you, Grease. <laughs> he would he would phone Garrett Brumfield. He's also the one that did the premature uh, Gatorade bath on Coach O. How small was that? Got a lot of attention, yes. He's interesting, an interesting man. One of the world's most interesting men. Here's Pro set. Straight ahead, gets some of that penalty yardage back. Brendan Hayes brought him down. Pro set finally talked about his patience, Grease. He finally gets his first start in LSU uniform. It was the Troy game. Oh, right, right, you wait all this time, and he fumbled in that game in Death Valley. And that, that was stuck in his head, too. But he, he's done it the right way. These millennials are, he's not swiping right or swiping left or whatever you do with the swiping. <laughs> he's sticking around and, and enjoying the, the fruits of his labor. Really enjoy talking to him. Swiping, Levy, really? Don't they still do that? He's been watching Swiper too much. <laughs> what app are you on, McShay? <laughs> Second and four. Here's Brosset. More yardage for him. Very close to the mark. We'll see where they spot him. Nate Evans made the stop. You see this? This is this is the little intricacies of, of Steve Ensmeyer. He gets in short yardage situations and he goes hurry up to keep that defense on the field. And it's Burrow smartly. With everyone diving right into the middle of the line, it's Burrow who gets the first down. And once they get the first down, now they'll go back into the huddle. See, they want to take their time, but when you get in crucial short yarded situations, Ensminger has put it in his game plan that he's going to go quick every single time to keep an advantage from a personnel standpoint. We showed earlier, we showed the sort of a helpless look. It was Daryl Mack sitting on the bench for UCF. He can't do anything about this. He can't get back on the field. We approach eight minutes left in the third. Here's Burrow, steps up, another deep shot. Jefferson is there. Not that time, of the flag comes in. Rashard Causey will get caught. Pass interference, number 21, defense. 15-yard penalty, automatic, first down. Kazi, Kazi was in good position there. I was on the sideline watching him. He, he looked back at the last second. Sometimes it's better just not to look back. It's better to read the receiver's eyes and go up and just play his eyes, waste through, through his hands and knock the ball out. But he decided to turn around because he was in such good position, trying to make a play on the ball and ran right into the receiver. Kazi is the patient equivalent to Nick Rosette. Hardly played prior to this season. He has persevered, the senior out of Miami. Look into a starting role. On the ground, it's Brosette. Leans forward for a few. Richie Grant brought him down. There is a flag. Offside, number 56, defense. Five yard penalty, first down. Pat Jasinski a little too eager. Monday night, it's the third round. The rubber match, if you will. Number one, Alabama. Number two, Clemson for the college football playoff national championship. Coverage kicks off at 8 p.m. Eastern. 2015, Bama won by five. And Clemson had the thriller in 2016. Of course, they met in the playoff again, but not for the championship. Here's Brosette straight ahead. Again, it's Evans. They are wearing down this UCF defense and wearing out this clock. So it leaves the way that LSU is to the offside on first down was on number 58, 58 defense. The way that LSU is playing defensively, this if, if they're able to go in now on offense and score, uh, it's going to be very difficult for UCF to get back in this football game if they go down 17. And Nick Brosette on that last run, Greece, does crush 1,000 yards on the season. Nice milestone for him. Unbalanced line here with the offensive line. It's Brosette again. Another marker down. Inside the 10. Nate Evans to stop. Illegal formation. More than four players in the backfield. Offense. Five-yard penalty. First down. 
try to get cute with the unbalanced line, bringing Sadiq Charles over from the left side to the right side. You can see here's a tight end, and here's Charles. But uh, too many men in the backfield. It's a physical drive here from LSU. Coming off the football, run the ball, play action, that one shot, and just... Burrow, already a four touchdown passes on the day. Overshot Terrace Marshall. It's an important third down here, obviously, for LSU and for Joe Burrow. You don't need to get all of it in this situation. You've got three points in your back pocket, which would make this a two touchdown game. And for UCF, they're in dire need of one of those patented turnovers. 27 on the season that they've had. And we want to use one right now. 32 consecutive games. There's Brandon Moore. Might need another house call. 93 yards. He took one back the other way in the first half. Set up the screen on third and 12 to Edwards Allaire. It's offensive linemen. <laughs> a couple things here. The fact that Damian Lewis jumped off means that they had a play call. They wanted to run a play. Because if you didn't call a play, how do you jump off, right? So if that was just going to be, we're going to go up and see if we can get a cheap one, then nobody would have jumped off at LSU. But now it's very clear you kicked the field goal. Tenth penalty on LSU so far. It has not been a disciplined game for either squad. Here's Cole Tracy from 28. On the way. And it is good. So no SEC statement there. It's merely just a field goal to put LSU up by 13 points. As soon as we are through here, particular game you have a rather great experience with, the Rose Bowl. Mm. We're going out west. And of course, it's Ohio State and Urban Meyer. That's the headline. I was amazed to know this. He has never been to the Rose Bowl That's before crazy. coaching in it. He said the beauty of it is even more remarkable than he ever dreamed. That's going to be uh, a fitting way for him to go out. Certainly, uh, you grow up in the state of Ohio, or you play in that rivalry, Michigan-Ohio State, you want to go to the Rose Bowl. And so what a fitting way for him to go out. Interesting how he will coach that. Will he be full on making every call? Or will he allow a Ryan Day, you know, handle some of this? I'll take some of this. It'll be interesting. His, his approach to yeah, it. I, think, I mean, Ryan Day calls the offense, right. and, and Urban kind of makes his suggestions. But uh, I don't think he's going to change that at all. I think you got you got to let Ryan Day. You think it's full on, do hands down, we're doing the whole thing? <laughs> Hopefully it's not as stressful the as whole this season has been. But I know this, Washington will come to play. They'll try to make it as stressful on him as possible. Kirk Herbstreit probably knows Urban as well as anyone. He said he had a conversation with him. Urban has been more relaxed than he has ever seen him at any time prior to this week. So seems to have settled in. Nicely setting up the upcoming Rose Bowl. Back to the studio. Here's Chris Cotter. Kentucky and Penn State Wildcats looking to put this thing away in the VRBO Citrus Bowl. Benny, Snell, you later. He became Kentucky's all-time leading rusher in this game. And Kentucky's up 20 on ABC. Wow, the SEC again. I know there's uh, seven SEC games in the next couple of days. Yeah. Right? Penn State getting hammered. Uh, Trace McSorley's last game. There's Matt to throw down the sideline. It's Davis. Oh! And he couldn't bring it down. Gabriel Davis, who had a beauty of a grab at the end of the half, could not haul that one in. Understand how bad things have gotten for LSU in the defensive backfield. So many injuries. Greedy Williams not here. They had to move John Dre Kirkland over to over to the defensive side they he was a wide receiver and they had to move him to cornerback just because they they don't have enough guys i talked to an assistant right before the second half he said they're down to five defensive backs in total three safeties two corners he asked me if i if i still could backpedal i told him i never could <laughs> five defensive backs Greece, even i know they won't be able to play the the dive <laughs> Well, John Troy Kirkland was beaten so bad on that play, Todd. He tried to swipe at Davis's legs just to trip him before catching the ball. He couldn't even get close enough to him to trip him. Why isn't UCF going to go right back to that situation? You got one-on-one -on -one coverage again at the bottom of the screen with Kirkland on Davis. That could have been a 75-yard touchdown. Would have been exactly what UCF needed. 
Tough break for Gabriel Davis. Here's Mack. And he slips down. And slips right into Glenn Logan. And Mack's helmet comes off. Boy, I do not understand why Josh Heifel and Daryl Mack are not throwing the ball targeting the same play they just they threw earlier to Davis down the field. Just trying, whenever Daryl Mack gets his eyes down and starts to look at the rush, bad things happen. When we talked with Dave Aranda, the defensive coordinator for LSU, he said, my number one goal is to get enough pressure for Daryl Mack to bring his eyes down. That is his Achilles Please heel. Please reset the game clock to four minutes, 15 seconds, which is the time when the player's helmet was removed. 4.15, please. Fifth sack of the game by LSU's defense. But Hypo has to make the adjustment. Okay, you Thank can't you. hold the ball back there and expect to, to, to go through two or three reads, drop back, throw a deep ball to Davis on the sideline on the third corner for LSU. It's as simple as that. Three straight three and outs. Justin Jefferson muffed the punt on a fair catch. It's picked up by UCF. Jacob Harris. It looked like Justin Jefferson, but he signaled for a fair yes. catch. Muffs the punt. Can't advance that, right? So it wouldn't be a touchdown. But these officials down here, look at Jefferson. It's definitely a fair catch. And fair catch. Definitely a muff punt. Oh, he slips. That's what happened. Okay. Yeah, that William gets... Field is that the kick was muffed by the receiving team and recovered by the kicking team. By rule, a kick cannot be advanced. It is first down and 10 for UCF from the spot of the recovery. It looked like the field. He slipped with yes. his left foot, and that's what caused him to watch his left foot right foot and it goes down got to make sure that wasn't a catch and then down but that's clearly a muff punt and a huge break for UCF and Greece, full marks to Mac Loudermilk it's a great punt that sends Jefferson going backwards it's a 52 yard punt that leads to the slippage and that leads in essence to the turnover wow just what UCF needed Jordan Jefferson, you got to think twice if you're backpedaling, going backwards, of, of fielding those kinds of catches. I know you want to keep it from bouncing inside the five, but it becomes a very dangerous proposition. Now all sorts timeout. of confusion. LSU has called timeout to challenge the ruling on the field that the kick was muffed by the receiving team. They're thinking he was down after catching the punt. After calling the fair catch. I think the uh, replay booth is going to take uh, take another look at that. The only thing they could possibly be looking at is did he catch the ball right. and then go down and was and could he be down? I don't think he ever had control of this ball. You gotta, it's just like a catch. You gotta control it to the ground. Yep. And uh, that ball clearly comes out. But worth taking a look at. Yeah, uh, it's a huge play. Critical yeah. play at this point in the game. His feet just come out from underneath him. I don't think he had it. No. You gotta think just like a catch. It's just like he was catching a ball thrown by a quarterback. And, he never had possession of that ball. And it all starts with the, the booming great punt by Mac Loudermilk. Boy, and UCF has done this time and time again. Benefiting from these kinds of turnovers, big plays. After review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. It's first down to 10 for UCF. LSU is charged with their final timeout of the game and may not challenge for the remainder of the game. You don't see challenges in college too often because they're so quick to buzz and review from the booth. So how about that? LSU already without any timeouts left. 
with 3.56 left in the third, and they can't challenge anymore. Well, that's gift wrapped. Yeah. Gift wrapped opportunity yep. for the Knights of UCF, the number eight team in the country. Here you go. Back to throw across the middle through the hands of Kalubiali, the tight end. Well, he had Kalubiali, and if he and if he's able to complete this, it's going to be a touchdown. Here he comes from this side. He's going to get the ball right behind Devin White. That's a good throw from Daryl Mack. UCF goes quickly. It's McCray. He swung around, picks up about five, stopped by Devin White. And Greece, I think Daryl Mack deserves a better fate at this point. He dropped that ball in perfectly for Gabriel Davis. Yep. Should have been a 75-yard score. That last pass dropped by his tight end. Here's third and five. Oh, man. Big false start here. Full start. Number 72, offense. Five-yard penalty, third down. That's the center, Jordan Jefferson. But you get in a third and five situation, you got to think that Josh Heupel is thinking four down territory here. So third and five, you can run your quarterback and get in a short yard situation, but third and 10 is a completely different animal. The penalties, 20 accepted penalties, 10 for each squad. Watch Kirkland, one-on-one -on -one with Davis again. Mack the throw, back of the end zone, and Davis can't haul that one in. This ball has to be thrown on the back shoulders. What Mackenzie Milton did so well running so free look at the left side of your screen you're going to see davis running wide open if the ball is thrown towards the back back here it's an easy touchdown but he throws it too far in the corner tough catch for davis and a missed opportunity yep that one's on the quarterback no question had him wide open there's matthew wright a 37 yard attempt mac loudermilk is the mortel holder of the year in case you didn't know, they have an award for the holder of the year. I don't recognize those awards. You don't? Because you didn't win it probably when you <laughs> held those one or two times. Wright's field goal is good. And we're back to a 10-point game with 3-0-1 to play here in the third quarter. A huge missed opportunity. But himself an afternoon. Four touchdown passes. And as tough as they come. Well, they only had 12 touchdown passes coming into this game all season long. But he had three in the game against Texas A&M, and now four here tonight. That's seven in his last two games. Joe Burrow has gotten better as the season has gone on, and I know this coaching staff is really excited about him being there for a whole offseason and going into next year as their starter. Edwards Alaire out beyond the 30. Jasinski made the stop. You know, Burrow's got a, a sort of a silly side to him. It's a big story around the country early on about his socks. Where his socks didn't match, seems to have gotten his sock game back together. Much stronger sock game. Now they match? Apparently they match now. They look like, they look like everybody else's it? socks. I thought he had one that was inside out and one that was regular. When you lose a seven well, overtime you, you game, me. you change him. Right. <laughs> if they're both white, you can't tell. I'm disappointed. Don't change. Don't ever change, Joe. There used to be some cartoon characters on his socks. Edwards Alaire, try the left side. Stop for a loss by Brendan Hayes. Speaking about Ohio State, Burrow's still very close to that program. He said during Christmas break, he actually went to Columbus, met with Irvin, sat down, still talks just about daily with his old teammates. He said he was surprised to hear that Urban Meyer wasn't going to be coaching, he's going to retire. He just doesn't see his quote, doesn't see Urban not coaching, which I don't know that uh, he is completely done coaching. Going to be in a more executive role now the athletic department for Ohio State. For the time being, these things, as always, are subject to change. Here's Burrow on third and nine to throw. Underneath to Dillon. Able to break free, stays on his feet. Derek Dillon already has a touchdown. Still on his feet. And picking up blocks along the way. And he's inside the 35 of UCF. That's a 38-yard gain. We want to talk about the maturation of Joe Burrow. Here it is right here. Here's his safety. He's going to come down here. So Joe Burrow's pointing. He needs Brosette to pick him up. So he changes the offensive line, allows Brosette to pick it up. 
knows how he's protected, steps into a throw, and gets a huge first down. That's playing quarterback at the next level, and that's how Joe Burrow has progressed. Final minute here in the third quarter. LSU by 10, looking to add to that lead. Here's Edward Delaire. Inside the 30, stays on his feet and keeps on going. Pushing the pile. LSU on this drive, wanting it more. Gain of 15. Well, we talked about everything that Clyde Edwards Alaire has been through coming into this game. And he opened with a kickoff return that set the tempo. And now he's running hard in the second half. And Ed O couldn't say enough good things about the way he prepared in bowl practice coming into this game. And that's how the third quarter will come to an end. You see Todd McShay. Happy New Year, everybody, from Glendale, Arizona. The PlayStation Fiesta Bowl. LSU looking up that 10-point lead on the ground. Edwards Alaire. Again, the second and third effort. I think that UCF defense really needed the breather between quarters. Well, they, they need a lot more than breath. They need, they need some more muscle in the middle because they're getting blown off the football by Cushenberry, the center, Damian Lewis, right guard, and Brumfield, the left guard. They, they've taken this game on their backs and are controlling the line of scrimmage. Good look at the grass stains in the back of Burroughs' jersey. He's earned every point today. Quick inside slam to Jamar Chase, who's had himself a whale of a game. Antoine Collier able to bring him down. That's a great job there with Burrow, knowing where the blitz is coming from. Pat Jasinski's coming on an A-gap blitz. He knows there's no one underneath. It checks right away to his underneath receiver on the slant. Really smart football today. Jamar Chase, six catches, 93 yards with a touchdown. He is the leading receiver today for LSU. First and goal. twice and Burrow able to recover it he bobbled it the first time then fumbled it and able to recover I think, nail biting time I think Joe. Joe Burrow got a little bit tied up with the blitz off the edge he was worried about the two defenders coming off the weak side and just didn't secure the football but at least got himself on to prevent the turnover catch a break there Look at the laminated chart on his wrist. It says, hang on to the snap. Second and goal. Pushed back from the eight. Throw set right into the pile. A whole lot of dark blue, light black, or whatever color the UCF is. Nate Evans makes the stop. These are the kinds of things that drive coaches absolutely bonkers. You're going down, down the field on offense. You get in a situation, short yards, inside the two-yard line, and we fumble the snap, and now we're third and ten from the ten in a ten-point game. If we kick a field goal, it's still just a two-score game. That was a huge play. Third and goal. Burrow. Back corner of the end zone. Jefferson couldn't haul it in. Richie Grant on the coverage, fourth down. Couldn't have had a better matchup if you're LSU. You get your best receiver on a safety, and the ball is thrown absolutely perfect. Jefferson made this play earlier in the game and just can't pull it in and focus on the feet to get the touchdown. Cole Tracy. One field goal away from tying the LSU record for the most field goals in a single season. This is from 28 yards on the way. Let it bounce into the end zone. Touchback, bring it out to the 25-yard line. Well, LSU has been outstanding offensively between the 20s, but in the red zone is where they've kind of balled down from time to time. The interception return for a touchdown this last sequence where they had to settle for the field goal and 
And I get it. You've been dominant defensively if you're LSU, but you have also played three quarters. You're down thin on your offense on your defensive line. You're thin at secondary, and this is an explosive offense that could get rolling at any moment. And with all the defensive problems for LSU, Greece, UCF, their offense in the third quarter, 12 plays for 18 yards. Taking a shot down the sideline, and the flag comes in. Gabriel Davis working on John Trey Kirkland, and they should go there every play the rest of the way. And you, you've got to target him. We talked about it earlier. Pass interference, number 13. Defense, 15-yard penalty. First down. John Trey Kirkland is, is playing wide receiver, kind of uses a trigger man. It's a wild card. They moved him around and they just had to move him back to corner because they knew they were in trouble at that position when the top three corners, including Greedy Williams, who's the number one corner on my board for the NFL draft, all not in this game. On the ground, Greg McCray trying to patiently pick his way. I can't tell you how difficult it is, right, to come in and play defensive back like this in this situation. You see the guys that have been, that are out of this game, but you're asking John Frey Kirkland to do something very difficult. Here's Matt. Able to get out of there. Darryl Mack on the run. Knows he has to get rid of it now. And he'll throw it away. Third and eight. And really the best defense against having these corners out here on islands is getting this pass rush. And so Rashard Lawrence, Andre Anthony, that's Divinity getting in there. They have to get pressure on Darryl Mack. That's their best answer. Not thinking that John Trey Kirkland is all of a sudden going to become a great corner. He doesn't have any experience right. playing. For. This is not an indictment on Kirkland. They have been pressed into an unfortunate situation. You knew about Williams. You knew about Fulton. You knew about Joseph. You didn't know you were going to lose Terrence Alexander. You didn't know you were going to lose Grant Delpit. Here's Mack. Steps up. And it's incomplete. I'm not sure they would have had the first down anyway. It is fourth down. Fourth down and eight. It's Divinity. It's Divinity is down. It is back for it at the 14-yard line. So we talked about the players that are down for LSU. And no greedy Williams coming into the game. We knew that. His best buddy growing up, Devin White. How could two players so similar in nature to outstanding football players be on the total opposite end of the argument to play in this bowl game as opposed to prepare for the NFL draft. It's, it's a fascinating conversation. They both made very different decisions and were both absolutely right in their decisions. Greedy Williams, his background, where he came from, he's got a daughter, he's thinking about his family. Yes. And Devin White just loves LSU, loves playing football. Told us last night he'd play even if they didn't pay him in the NFL. And he wanted to set an example for this program going forward. And sitting in that room with him yesterday, it was Devin White and Grant Delpit. And Grant Delpit's going to take over for Devin White if he decides to go to the NFL from a leadership standpoint. And you could see Delpit soaking in all of that leadership and approach from Devin White. And White told us that Greedy Williams was in tears was crying when he told White he was going to pass on this ball. Todd tells you how much respect he has for Devin White and how hard it was to go tell one of his best friends that he wasn't going to play with him in the ball game. Devin White, I asked him, did you put in your paperwork to the NFL Advisory Committee for the draft? He said, no, I haven't even put it in, which is very unusual. It tells you he legitimately is just completely focused on this game. It's Morrow, the tight end. I'll be on the 20. Bring up a third down and short. And you know what's going to happen with, with Devin White? His legacy is going to be even greater as an LSU Tiger because he made this decision to come back and play in this game and set the example for the future. You see, those, both of those guys are in the top five of Todd McShay's big board. Yes. Getting bigger every day. What mock are we up to, McShay? One. <laughs> Slow down. All the way up to one. And it's, it's third and two here. Inside handoff throw, set, got the first down and more. Out beyond the 30-yard line, Joey Connors made the stop. Here's what I think about the sitting out, Greece, and I get it. I don't think anyone in college football likes it, but some players and people will understand it. 
I think that's fair. Yeah. No, no. no one can be in favor. You can't be for it. Players sitting out purposely. But you can understand the reasons they do that. Well, listen, if you really want to be honest about it, none of these players being compensated anything. Okay? They're, they're getting a scholarship. Coaches are making all kinds of money. They're going yep. one place to yes, another. They are. And that's the reality of college football and where we are. So you can't fault these kids looking after their future. No, like I said, you certainly understand it. There is, there is no blame. And LSU has made it clear there was no resentment on the team. None whatsoever towards Greedy Williams. And then you flip the page a little bit. And on the UCF sideline is their defensive coordinator, Randy Shannon, who came out with his public comments that he thinks this could take the player who skips it. A, the NFL might look at you differently. And maybe down the road in the future, maybe this becomes a trend with a player. Maybe even off the football field. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't agree with Randy Shannon's comments, but it's definitely going to continue. And it's definitely going to be a trend in college football as we're playing more games and, and players are at more risk for injury. Here's Brosette right up the middle. Another first down approaching midfield. Garrett Broomfield is dominating at the line of scrimmage. The senior left guard. It's very clear what the offensive strategy is here from Steve Ensminger as this fourth quarter comes down. And Broomfield has been vocal on the sideline, the leader of this offensive line. He says, run it behind us. We don't need anything else. I know that our quarterback Joe Burrow has thrown four touchdowns, but to win this game, to eat up clock, and to keep making first downs on the ground is the way to win. They've had the same starting offensive line for the final five games of the season. On the ground on first down at 10. Grosset bounces out of there, and not this time. He'll be stopped for a loss by Antoine Collier. LSU started seven different offensive lines in the first eight games. Keep in mind, they won the first five games of the season. They started red hot, Todd. And they've, they've been so impressive today. We said that the biggest difference between LSU and Central Florida is going to be in the trenches. The offensive line has protected Burrow all day long. Now when they need to run out the clock, pound away, they've done a tre tremendous job, especially in the second half. And I've just been so impressed defensively, and their defensive front really controlled the game as well. This is four-minute offense with eight minutes left. Correct. Second and 13. Set again. But everyone asks about the difference between an SEC or a Power Five school and a school of five. Yes. And, and I think I think the biggest difference is you, it's so hard to find the big men that can actually play at a high level. And so to get to have the depth is the difference to me. Week in and week out, if UCF is playing the schedule that LSU is playing, I, I just can't buy it. LSU played one of the toughest schedules in all of college football. I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. And you're absolutely right, Todd. If for everybody that wonders, Power 5 versus the non-Power 5, look at the line of scrimmage right now, and you'll have your answer. Burrow steps up, take another deep shot. Got a man. It's Sullivan. All the way down to the 10-yard line of UCF, Richard Carsey, Richard Carsey and stuff. So whether they're running the ball or whether they're pass protection, take a look at these five guys. They're going to give a pocket for Joe Burrow. One, two, three, step up and drive that ball down the seam. You don't make that throw unless you have a clean pocket to step into as a quarterback, and that's exactly what Todd was talking about. Under six to go, and now you'd expect LSU to go back to the ground game. 42 yards on that last pass play. Burrow to Sullivan. Joe Burrow with 394 passing yards and counting. They do, in fact, keep it on the ground with Brosette. Gets back to the line of scrimmage. I think it's worth mentioning, just for a little bit more perspective, sure. okay? Because this is what this game was about. The Power Five versus the non-Power Five. The playoff conversation. This offensive line for LSU was nowhere near the best offensive line in college football. They're nowhere near the top 15, 20, 30 offensive lines in college football. So uh, what they're doing tonight uh, is really impressive. But there's a lot better offensive lines out there in college football, i.e. Alabama. Just to name one. Message received. And I think UCF is receiving the message as well. Here's Burrow. He wants to stay in bounds. Now he'll be swung around by Pat Jasinski. 
with an even five minutes left to go. The streak is on the line for UCF. They have not lost since December 17th of 2016. The Auto Nation Cure Bowl, they filled a Arkansas State 31 to 13 in that game. 25 consecutive wins. And on the UCF argument, Greece, they can only beat who's on their schedule. No question. Nobody's and, taking anything away from okay. what they've done. And so that begs the schedule question. And we, we've heard all about it. The conversations they've had, you know, the two for one with Florida. Yep. Scott Strickland, their athletic director, and Danny White, the athletic director from UCF. On the ground, it's Prosette again. There's no question. The Orlando Sentinel got that email exchange, Greece. And, you know, Dan's in the NFL level. I mean, you just, they are so valuable to your team. And he said, we felt so good when we would get to the 35-yard line because we knew we were guaranteed at least 35, or three points. 40-24 LSU. Tracy's big kick, you go back to September 15th against Auburn. Boots it through with no time remaining. Then at five field goals, three extra points, they'll blow out Georgia, 36-16. Get this, the kick against Auburn, Greece, that was the first time in LSU history they had a walk-off field goal in regulation time. Wow. They've been playing 125 years, <laughs> you know? Any kind of all-time LSU record is a record. Good on you, Cole Tracy. 40-24, LSU with 4.12 left. In the game, offense, five-yard penalty, first down. Obviously, desperation time here for UCF, but it's still a two-score game. You have two touchdowns and two two-point conversions, but you got to start here on this, treat this like a two-minute drill, and go down the field. They're going to have to throw the football, and I like those inside slants with Daryl Mack. LSU held the ball for over seven minutes on that last drive. There's one of those wow. slants. Trey Nixon could not hang on to it. There have been a lot of drops for UCF today. We've had some big ones. Gabe Davis had a huge drop, which would have been a 70-plus touchdown. And another drop there from Trey Nixon. Darryl Mack hasn't played his best game, but he hasn't had all the help either. And Mack's going to be taken down. I saw a face mask from here. Jacob Phillips, the first man in, and another flag comes in. It was clearly a face mask against LSU. And then we'll check that second marker, too. The 22 accepted penalties already in the game before this. There are two fouls on the play, both by the defense. Personal foul, face mask. After the play was over, personal foul, unnecessary roughness, number six. Both 15-yard penalties will be enforced. First down. Wait. The number on the face mask was number 43. You get a great blitz, a great stunt, and Jacob Phillips comes around, and they get the sack. The face mask is one thing. Sometimes that's unavoidable, but personal foul after the fact, and you're just giving UCF a short field here. I think there's one thing we know about UCF. They're not going to give up. They're no. not going to throw the towel in. They're going to continue to fight. They have just two first downs, Greece, in this half. Both have come on penalties. They need to go. And quickly. Mack will take a shot. Got a man open, and it's intercepted. John Battle came over to pick it off in front of Gabriel Davis. And Davis was open there for a moment. Here's the run this on the outside. Here's the safety battle. He's going to be over the top. This ball needs to be thrown right about here, but you can't throw it too high with a lot of air. Okay, battle, an opportunity to come break it up. So it's not an interception. Did he not get a foot down? He comes down out of bounds. Oh, yeah. So it just goes as a noisy, incomplete pass. Third and two. On the ground to Otis Anderson, trying to pull away from some people. And Devin White just won't have it. White yanks him down by his jersey. Yet another first down. 
and now you've got to run five or six plays. You've winded the defensive line, and so now the pass rush is not quite as severe. Gives you an opportunity to throw the ball down the field. Mac loads up and fires back of the end zone. Gabriel Davis was in the neighborhood. So too was John Battle. Wow. Time he had time to throw the football, but he was wildly inaccurate. He had Davis streaking on the on the deep post, but missed him by about 10 yards. He's had Davis all game. He, yeah. He's had Davis all game. Mack has missed on his last seven pass attempts. Mackenzie Milton, these are the kinds of situations where he was so good. Calm under pressure, accurate with his passes down the field. You wonder, can't help but wonder if you're a UCF fan what this game would have looked like if Mackenzie Milton had been playing. Well, that's it, and so we're not going to get any final Full answers. Start. Number 88, offense. Five yard penalty, second down. Right, there's always going to be that asterisk or caveat, the definite answer. Does UCF belong? Well, if they would have had their, their superstar quarterback, this is a different game, to which LSU will counter. If we would have had our yeah, eight starters yeah. on defense, it would also have been a different game. He started out no excuses, right? No excuses and uh, on either side. The Trey, the left side to the 24. Battle bounced him out, 304 left. Because you say, okay, Mackenzie Milton's playing. He's throwing right. the ball to, to Gabe Davis. Well, how about if Greedy Williams yes. is guarding Gabe Davis? He's not going to be as wide open as he's been today. Of course. Grant Delpa doesn't get kicked out of the game. Joseph is there as well. So is that Alexander. And here's McCray. Knocked out of the three. John Battle again on the tackle. And yet they are not out of this game, right? They got to punch this ball in. There's plenty of time left. They need to punch this in, get the two point conversion, then anything can happen. They go on the ground. And that's costly. McCray taken down at the line of scrimmage. This is where you need to let Daryl Mack run the football. 230 pounds. No that, that's your best option. He did it four times against Memphis. Slam him up in there. Second and goal. Mack, all sorts of trouble. He'll throw that away. He has taken some wicked hits. Kobe Stevens got him that time. <laughs> I do not like throwing the ball down here. Just maybe a speed option, a misdirection with the quarterback. But the only other thing I would think about would be the run the quarterback up the middle, pop pass to the tight end. That would have some sting based on who's playing quarterback. Third and goal. Taj McGowan in the backfield. It's McGowan. And he gets there for the score. Touchdown, UCF. Yes, they're going for two. That's the easy man. Sean Lawrence is down on the field. He's had a heck of a game, too. We'll step out. Two-point conversion away, being a one-score game. 2.24 left. The throw for it. Over the defender, it's Otis Anderson for the two-point conversion. And here we go. 2.24 left. Eight-point game. UCF has one timeout for me. This is a tough throw for Daryl Mack, and he did it with excellence. And a great catch from Anderson. He's going to get pressure right in the space immediately from Stevens. And then to negotiate the defender between you and a back running away from you, not an easy throw and catch, Todd. I love the, the play call by Josh Heupel. You had three options there. First was an inside handoff, which he read and wasn't going to work. Then you get out and you have the, the run pass option. And he just baited the defender and, and waited, waited, waited. And then at the perfect time, he got rid of that football. They wasted a lot of time on those first three downs before the touchdown. I had no problem with that, though, because there's plenty of time. It's two and a half minutes left. If you get the onside kick, it's a short field by definition, and you, you don't want to leave any time left if you, if you are able to score for LSU. So I don't think time is of an issue right now okay. for UCF. So if UCF comes back and wins this game right now, Greece, we put them right into the SEC next year or not? <laughs> you willing to go there? No? Big Ten? 
Uh, I, listen, if I was the ACC or the yeah, Big 12, I'd yeah. be seriously looking at it. Take them right now. Yes. Even if they don't come back and win, they've shown you enough. Here's the onside kick. All the way. Takes a bounce. It's loose. And I think it's recovered by LSU. Foster Morrow. That football was right there for a handful of Knights to jump on. Wow. That's the best onside kick I have seen in a long time. Great job with this kick. And you see the front line for LSU comes up. And Jefferson just gets short hopped. Very difficult. And you're right, that ball was on the ground for a beat, two beats. Looked like Grant, Richie Grant was right there, 27. McGowan was there. And how about how about Foster and Moreau? Foster Moreau gets it. Moreau was able to spot it and then just dove at it in great effort. Hey, it's a great onside kick by Wright. And uh, Justin Jefferson's had a tough game. That almost got a lot tougher for Justin Jefferson. Grosset for three or four. UCF has that one timeout in their back pocket. They're going to take and it. And there it is. And you talk about a game of inches and how close UCF has been. I mean, that close Ooh. after going right down the field against an LSU's defense was winded. So the likelihood of them, you know, being able to go back down was higher than it has been the entire game. And they were this close to getting an opportunity to go down and tie this football game up. I guess, like I said, that's the best onside kick I've seen, and I'm including the NFL. You just don't see, you don't see them anymore. You certainly don't see them successful. And that was right there for the taking by the Knights. Second down and six upcoming. Now UCF is just outside of the zone here where they can stop this clock. A first down and seals this game. So you can force them into a field goal situation and get a block there. Second and six. Girl set for a couple. Clock will wind. 2.13 left. Joey Connors makes the stop. Brosette 27 carries. 115 yards on the ground. 116 now, big part. Joe Burrow's going to take sweet time. You don't want to come out of this huddle until about 10 seconds on the clock, and you want to snap it under three seconds on the play clock. Remember how this game started? Joey Connors rocking Joe Burrow's world. And Burrow responded in a big, big way. Third and two. Game on the line. Rosette straight ahead. Won't get there. It will be fourth down. Pat Jasinski made sure he couldn't get to the line to game. Talk about Pat Jasinski, who's played a lot of football, a senior, Mike linebacker. Now a decision to make for Ed Orgeron. Oh, take the field goal, try the field goal here? No. No. Not. All right, so hang on, everybody relax. <laughs> was, that, was that machine from the field? Yeah, no. My mic was no. open. I was, no. I was talking no. myself. That was a groan. All right, so if you don't get it, though. So, so he... It looked like Ed Orgeron wanted them to go up and try to get him to jump off sides. But they're not going to be able to do it. He's going to take the penalty and, and punt this football down. 47 wanted, seconds left. He won Play of game. Offense. Five-yard penalty. You see Ed Fourth Orgeron down. talking talking to Joe Burrow. He said, listen, I wanted you to get up to the line of scrimmage and go through a whole snap count, try to get him to jump off sides. And if we don't, we'll take the, the penalty. UCF has chosen to decline the 10-second runoff. Therefore, the clock will start on the snap. So one more opportunity for that young man. Yes, third career start. They're going to add a second back on the clock. You think they'd come full on for the block. Josh Groudon is back to punt. Otis Anderson at his eight. It's a good snap. All you want to do is get that in the air. Bounce. Drop dead at the 11. With 39 seconds remaining. 
We've had the most penalties combined in Fiesta Bowl history. 26. Congratulations to all involved. Well, no matter what ends up happening in this last drive, both of these programs can walk out of this stadium with their heads held high. A lot of questions about UCF coming in. Could they play with the big boys? Yeah, again. They, they got pushed around, and, but they fought to the end, and they're in a position now. That's all you want. Position to go down and score and tie this football game. Beat Auburn in the same spot last year. Yep. Had 40,000 fans in attendance in Atlanta. A few less here today. Here's Mack. Takes a hit as he throws. And he's fortunate, just falls incomplete. Well, the last thing I would have told Daryl Mack if I was Josh Heupel when he ran out on the field was listen, you cannot hold the football. Okay, we can't block them up front. I know you want to hold it and throw the ball down. Throw the ball quick. We need some slants. Just get a few completions here to get this thing going. Mack has missed his last nine throws. It's 10. Trey Nixon couldn't go up and get it. Well, and that, that was a hook and ladder play. They wanted to get the ball to Nixon, and McRae was coming out of the backfield right behind him. He was going to pitch it back a la Boise State when they did it here right. against yes. Oklahoma to tie that game. Chris Peterson. Third and ten. Good protection this time. He's got the time. Throws down the middle of the field. Bounces up in the air. And it is intercepted. Picked off by Jacoby Stevens, who will just go down with 20 seconds left. That should seal the deal for LSU. I think it's fitting with all the injuries that LSU had on the defensive side in the secondary with the ejections that they had tonight of Grant Delpit, Terrence Alexander, that it's a backup safety in Jacoby Stevens that gets the interception that seals it for LSU. And we are a knee away. Great effort. Great effort by both teams. This was a great football game. And uh, can, nothing but great things to say about UCF and their uh, record. Congratulations on a great season. But they're not playoff contenders. The conversation.